Get my six. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Homesteading Off the Grid and whatever this channel's about. It's starting to be about gnats today. Looks like I'm sitting in a gnat hatch. Actually, today's video in this very humid 90 degree afternoon uh, is about whittling and whistling. <whistles> kind of, sort of. Wouldn't you know it, it's got to be creepy stories to go with everything, even something as simple as whittling. So I mentioned, I think yesterday in a video, uh, that I've been getting addicted to this whittling thing. It's it's become more than just a hobby. It's almost uh, like an addiction. And here's why. Because when I do it, it's the only thing I think of. It's got to be. I've got to concentrate or I will cut myself with these very sharp little flex cut carving knives. Not sponsored. So I spent hours yesterday doing it and uh, did three or four different carvings. And my wife had been out with uh, one of our best friends and, and her son and our son just having a good old time. And they came back uh, just before dark. And I'd already built a, a campfire up here at the campground over here a little ways. Just kind of sitting around the campfire. I was whittling. And um, so I showed my family and our friends what, what I had made. And uh, our friend, she laughed when she saw the mushrooms especially. But uh, she hung out with us for a while. They actually come up to join me at the campground and they ended up joining me until like 11 p.m. We had so much fun. But you know, as is always the case, you get a couple people sitting around a campfire or a small group and story time starts. Well, turns out this woman's father, before he passed away, used to whittle quite a bit and he was very good at it. And she was going on and on about all the little toys that he would make uh, her and her sisters when they were when they were kids, and then of course all the grandkids when the grandkids came along. And uh, she said that people would always tell him that he was the best whittler they'd ever known, and he would just laugh. He was a very humble guy. Uh, he would say thank you, but then he'd say that he was the second best, second best whittler uh, there ever was because the guy that taught him was even better, and. And so I said to our friend, wow, that guy must have been really good. If your father was as good as you're saying that, that he was, and I have no reason to doubt you. So other guy must have been uh, exceptional. Who was that? Do you know? Was that like your grandfather or somebody in the family? And she said, my dad told me about that guy once. And I never wanted to hear anything about him again because the story was so creepy. She said she she... She still doesn't know if she believes it, but she certainly doesn't not believe it. And I said, well, you know, we're sitting here around a campfire. Pray tell. So the story is this. Now, her father, before he, he passed away, uh, he would have been a baby boomer, um, Vietnam veteran. He was in the Marines. Uh, late 70s, I guess. So when he was a kid, which would have been like 10 years oldish, grade schoolish, probably in the mid 1950s. Uh, he lived in rural Virginia, but not so rural that the, there weren't enough kids living in close enough proximity to where they would all meet in one location to get on the, the bus in the mornings to go to school. And uh, there was just a handful of kids. There was a little girl named Anna Marie who loved to dance. Uh, she would always take her dancing shoes with her to school and begged the teacher to let her dance in front of the class and show what she'd learned. And uh, there was, of course, uh, our friend's father, who had a brother, by the way, a year younger than him, and they were obsessed with football without revealing who my friend is. I, I don't think she'd mind me mentioning her dad's name. His name was Jimmy. And Jimmy had a brother named Jack. And then there was this other kid named Reggie, who was, I guess, the bad apple of the barrel. Uh, who met at this bus stop as well. Well, they all had to pass this old farmhouse, probably more like an old sharecropper's house like ours, that sat about a half mile back before the bus stop. And every morning, 
there'd be this older man for them at the time, old old for them. Uh, he was a World War II veteran, actually. Uh, sitting on his porch, he'd be whittling, he'd be whistling. His name was Willie. And little Maria would walk by every morning and she'd just wave and smile and say, Hey, Willie, how are you? And he'd say, I'm just fine, princess, how are you? And she'd say, I'm good. What you whittling? And he'd say, oh, I'm just making a little this or making a little that, whatever he was making. And he'd say, do you have a good day at school? And she'd say, okay, Willie. And she knew that when school was over and uh, she was coming home in the afternoon, she'd see that old man, old whistling, whittling Willie sitting there on that porch, whistling and whittling just as he had been doing uh, when she'd gone to catch the bus that morning. And then of course, Jimmy and Jack would go by and they were often throwing a football back and forth uh, between each other as they did and they'd say hi to Willie and Willie would say hi back boys how you doing hope you have a great day at school of course they know they'd see him again that afternoon on the way back from school and Willie he'd he'd get back to whittling and whistling but he knew who was coming next and he knew that something would announce his presence and that would be old reggie a uh, spoiled little entitled kid that had a bad attitude and just didn't have any respect for anybody including and especially his elders well willie whistling willie usually knew reggie was coming by because reggie'd usually throw a stick or something at him and say whittle that you old freak or whatever and then he'd just take off he's just a mean just a mean kid but Willie, you know, World War II vet and whatnot that he was, uh, and he was a widower. He had adult children scattered around the country. Some of them actually came to come see him sometimes. Uh, but he didn't let, you know, the meanness uh, of this 10-year-old kid get to him. He'd, he'd seen real mean, you know. He'd seen war, and he actually was uh, down there helping liberate the Philippines from Japan in World War II. That's the theater he fought in. So he, he's uh, spent time in familiar territory to myself, as myself, down there in Mindanao, where all kinds of weird stuff happens, where they have witches and witch doctors and cannibals and all kinds of mystical creatures and beings that may or may not exist, like the Capri and the Sigmen and all these things. You go to those places, you learn quick when you get home not to tell people those stories because they'll just think you crazy. Why, they might even give you some sort of a nickname like Crazy Lake. Well, too bad because I was already that was already my nickname anyway. But you learn quick not to talk about some of the things that you saw or that you'd seen, but you don't forget. And sometimes, as is the case for old Whittling Whistling Willie, you even pay attention to how such things take place, how they happen, and how you can do certain things yourself. Like maybe write certain stories with a certain coconut wood pen given to you by one of them types of folks over there, among other things. Yeah, you're like, well, that took a wide turn. Trust me, it'll all make sense. If you've been watching these videos long enough, it already does. So anyway, that year, time did what it does. It marched on quickly, and as old Willie could tell you, hearing howls or voices or something from back there. Keep getting my six. Well, and as many of you, as many as many of you who are watching this video could tell anybody, the older you get, the quicker time flies. Well, time flew, and next thing you know, it's Halloween. There goes little Anna Marie past Willie's house. She's actually wearing her ballet uniform. Uh, she's dressed up for the Halloween costume party back at school. See, this is when they still used to actually have Halloween parties, Christmas parties, these types of things, instead of holiday get-togethers or whatever they're called. I don't know. Um, Every time they, I start to remember what they call something, they determine that it's offensive to somebody again, so they change the name again, so whatever. Uh, and uh, she said hi to Willie, and he told her she looked just as cute as could be, have a good good day there in school. And she says, are you going to be handing out 
candy tonight on Halloween if we come trick-or-treating? He says, well, you're going to have to just come by and see. I might have something. And uh, she says, okay, see ya. Next comes old Jimmy and Jack passing their football. They're dressed up like football players wearing the, you know, favorite team's uniforms. Tell him, you know, happy Halloween and want to know if he's going to be giving out candy that evening. And he tells them they're just going to have to come by and see. And then, of course, he, he gets the announcement that uh, Reggie's on the way because hitting the head with well. Here comes Reggie. Picks it up. It's a big old piece of hickory. This isn't. This is yellow tulip poplar. Hickory's very hard. And uh, Reggie yells, whittle that, you old freak. He picks it up and he says, well, I think I will, Reggie. I think I will. And uh, he says, happy Halloween to you, Reggie. And Reggie cusses at him and takes off running down to the bus stop. So afternoon, the kids see him again. Most of them are nice. Reggie's not. He's just not nice to anybody. Reggie hates himself, so therefore he hates everybody else too. That's the thing. That's the, You find people that are just bitter, jaded, old curmudgeons, hate the world and everyone in it. It's because they hate themselves. Get away from those people. They're toxic and it'll rub off on you, okay? That stuff's contagious. Get away from them. So that night, you know, rural area that it is, those being the only kids of that age that there are in the area, they all get together and go trick-or-treating. Not that any of them was particularly fond of Reggie. So they go to Whistling Willie's house, and of course he's sitting there by the light of the fully lit jack-o'-lanterns on his... uh on the rails of his porch there and he's whistling and he's whittling so they come up on the porch and there's little Anna Marie dressed up like the prettiest little ballerina you ever saw she holds out her pillowcase and she says trick or treat well Willie reaches into his shirt pocket he had here and he, he pulled something out it was small enough to where he could put it in his hand like this and he gets his hand leans over right there gets his hand right up in front of Maria's eyes and he opens his hand and there was this little wooden hand carved ballerina they looked just like her and her eyes just got big and her mouth gaped wide and she took it up and she looked at the face and she was just amazed at the detail and its likeness and how it was just looked just like her and she said it's just like me and Willie said yeah just like you happy Halloween so she runs uh, off to the side and here's Jimmy and Jack and they say trick-or-treat they hold out their bags and uh, their pillowcases and so Willie, he reaches back in his pocket and he comes out and he opens his hands, or his hand, but in his hand there are two little figurines, both football carvings. One's a quarterback, he's actually got a little wooden football in his hand, he's hauling back to throw the ball, and then the other one's in the receiving position. And the likeness was just like the brothers, uh, to include the moles on, the one had a mole on this side of his face, the other on the other, he even got the moles right. So they move off to the side and little Reggie steps up and he doesn't hold out his bag. He just goes, hmm, you know, like impress me, you know. So the old guy reaches in his shirt pocket and he comes out and he goes like this. And he opens his hand and there's a little wooden figurine and it's Reggie. The likeness is, is, is it's incredibly striking. And Reggie's standing there with his head, hands down to his sides like this, fits, fists all balled up and he's got this mean hateful look on his face because he hates the world and everyone in it again because he hates himself and Reggie sees it and he he let a semi compliment slip he said just like me and oh wh whittling whistling Willie said just like you so the kids run off another going another mile up the road to the next house could you imagine tri imagine trick-or-treating under those rural country circumstances or conditions like that so anyway uh what reggie didn't notice because he didn't take time to look and it might have been a little bit too dark as well but inside those little miniature figurines balled up fists were chunks of wood and rocks because sometimes reggie even threw rocks at this old guy just a mean old cuss so the kids finished their trick-or-treating for the night they went home and ate more candy than they're usually allowed to because it was halloween and all and uh they get that, that sugar rush, but then it wears off, so they get that post-sugar rush crash, and next thing you know, they're laying in bed, getting ready to go to sleep. So Anna Marie had taken her little figurine that just looked like her little ballerina, and she'd stuck it up on her nightstand. And even after she turned the light off, she could still see it because 
Not only was it Halloween night that night, but it was the night of a full moon. And the light from that full moon was shining into her bedroom through the window. And it was lighting upon that little ballerina. And Anna Marie loved that thing so much. She's just looking at it, looking at it, starting to fall asleep. Next thing, next thing she knows is figurine, it starts dancing. It's dancing and her eyes grow heavy. They go shut and she goes out like a light. She thought of it the next day and she just figured she must have been dreaming. Little wooden figurines don't come to life at midnight when there's a full moon and it's Halloween night. It's preposterous. Anybody who would believe such things would certainly have to be crazy. So a couple miles up the road at the Jameson's farm, Jimmy and Jack are laying there. They share a room and they'd put their little figurines on opposite ends of their dresser from each other, set it up, looked like they were going for a Hail Mary, quarterback passing to the receiver. And they were watching and well, Jimmy fell asleep first. Jack was trying to stay awake because he thought he saw one of them figurines moving. And just as he started to shut his eyes and be out like a light for the night, that little quarterback threw the ball to the receiver. Of course, his eyes were closed and he was asleep, so he didn't see that the receiver actually caught it. Such things could never happen, though, could they? Even with the magic of a Halloween night with the moon full and bright, something whittled by an old crazy war vet that had spent too much time in Mindanao, Well, little Reggie, he was already asleep. He wasn't going to lay awake and fight sleep to see. Look at that little figurine that looked like a little miniature angry him. Hands all balled up and fisted sourpuss look on his face. So he was asleep, dead to the world, when he was awakened by a strange sound. He woke up and said, somebody whistling? Hey, trying to go back to sleep. Rolls over, closes his eyes. He wakes up. He's looking around. He looks up on his dresser, which where he'd put the figurine, and you can see it as well because that same full moon's shining the light in the window. He looks over just in time to see what appears as if that little figurine is running behind the the lamp stand. So Reggie sits up in bed and he looks. He squints his eyes and he realizes that figurine's not there. And just as he's coming to this realization, he gets hit right between the eyes by a tiny little something pretty hard. So he feels around for it, finds it, picks it up, can't see it. So he goes over and turns on that lamp and he realizes he's looking at a tiny little piece of hickory wood carved into the shape of a stone. He's like, what the? And he hears from behind him and he turns around just in time to get hit again with another hickory carved stone. And he looks down and he sees this little miniature figurine of his run up underneath his bed. So he's like, what the? He jumps down onto the floor. He's looking up underneath the bed thinking there's no way this can be true. When all of a sudden, mm, right in the Achilles tendon from behind, the little figurine had taken one of the little sticks that had been carved to, the sh to be as sharp as the end of a needle, by the way, and stabbed him in the Achilles tendon from the other side. Whew. Tell you, I could go on and on, but I'm just gonna tell you that was a rough night for Reggie. He'd try to go to sleep, try and he tried, but every time he'd get to sleep, he'd hear <whistles> And he'd wake up and he'd get pelted with a little rock or stuck with a little stick. And worse of it is when the sun came up the next morning and it was time to go to school, he still couldn't see that miniature. It was nowhere. The kids all walked by Willie's house that morning. And Anna Marie, of course, was always there first. She was always five minutes early everywhere she went. She said, thanks again for my treat last night, Willie. I left it safe and sound sitting on my nightstand there this morning. I can't wait to get home and see it again this afternoon. And he says, well, you're welcome, sweetie. I'm glad you like it so much. She goes, oh, I, I had a dream last night that it was actually dancing. It's so beautiful. And Willie just smiled, a fox-like grin, and said, well, that was a very vivid dream, honey. We all know those things can't really happen. Why, that's preposterous. Don't go around telling too many people that, or they'll think you're crazy. She goes, oh, I won't, Willie. I know it was just a dream. She leaves, and he's just back to whittling and whistling. And then the brothers come by. 
Jimmy and Jack, and they thank him, and they're talking about how much they love it, and Jack had a question. So what's that, Jack, Willie says. He goes, I thought yesterday the quarterback had the ball, but when we woke up this morning, the receiver had it. Were we wrong? Oh, Willie, he just said, well, it must have been, you know, too dark to, to really see the detail. I can't even remember which one I gave the ball to because, as you know, I'm getting old. Don't want to be telling too many people those sorts of things, though. Kids, they'll think you're crazy. Boys say, yeah, you're right. Oh, well, whatever. Thanks. Can't wait to get home and see him. We left him safe and sound on our dresser there when we left the house this morning. Willie wishes him a good day in school. Well, old Reggie comes through looking like death warmed over. I mean, he looked like stale coffee. Heated up in a broken microwave. Yeah, that bad. And uh, Willie says to him, hey, Reggie, how'd you like your little figurine? And Reggie's just looking at him. In his mind, he's saying, he knows, he knows. And uh, old whistling Willie the Whittler says, by the way, Reggie, where is your little guy? The other kids left him on a dresser and on a nightstand. Where's yours? Where was yours when you left the house this morning? Reggie says, I don't know. I don't know. I can't find him. And Willie says, that's all right, Reggie. I'm sure you'll be seeing him again. <whistles> the end.